or a later playback on YouTube. So if you don't want to be on screen, no problem. Just make sure you keep your video muted. Um, my, I'll be on camera anytime I'm speaking, but thankfully for all of you, I'm not speaking the whole time today. So today we have Kyle Bivens, the Procurement and Sustainability Manager at First Star Fiber Corporation, who will be um, talking about recycling in Nebraska and what's happening and what the future holds. So Kyle, go right ahead. All right, thank you very much, Michelle. Um, I'll get started here. Uh, I'm going to go through a PowerPoint. I think um, this answers a lot of the questions that um, you know we were looking for today. Um, with it being a smaller group, um, if you want to ask questions in the middle, I'm totally fine with that. If you want to wait till the end, I mean, I'm good with that as well. So I will get going here. So a little bit about us at First Star. Um, we started back in, uh, I believe it was 1998. And in 2004, I believe, was uh, when we first started with the actual MRF, the material recovery facility, um, meaning with all the equipment for the sorting and the disc screens. And um, we are the largest mechanical MRF in Nebraska. And in fact, I believe for a while we were the largest um, in the Midwest, uh, whatever you want to think of the Midwest being, but um, we are certainly one of the larger facilities here in the middle of America. Uh, we process recyclables, not just from Omaha, but um, a large percentage from Lincoln. And, um, and then we do get communities from all over Nebraska. We stretch out into South Dakota, Iowa, Missouri, Kansas, where uh, we do get both separated materials and single stream materials um, up to our Omaha facility to process. We have over 120 people between both of our facilities in Omaha and Lincoln. Um, that uh, as many different industries right now is um, challenging to uh, both keep folks and find people. Um, even before all this COVID stuff, I mean, it was um, yeah, one of our challenges in being able to, um, like I said, be able to find quality employees and um, try to keep them around. Um, one quote here, I'm gonna just read this word for word, value, sensible waste management, and are always looking to expand and diversify the type of materials that we are able to recover. So really what that means is um, we kind of um, look at ourselves as more than just a standard, you know, cardboard, paper, maybe some plastics, um, recycle, recycling facility. Um, with me being in the business now for 15 years at First Star, um, from my experience, and I was just in Texas here a month ago, and we are one of the few places that really try to look for outlets for basically diverting material from the landfill. Uh, really, we really do that more than quite a few other facilities, especially here in the Midwest. Uh, when you get into plastics, I believe the number is 20,000 different types of plastic. Um, once you look at all the different combinations, so especially if there's a large quantity, I mean, a business that's producing something in a large quantity, I mean, we're going to try to help you find a home for that and keep it out of the landfill. And uh, that kind of leads right into the next point there, the hefty energy bag, as uh, many of you are familiar with. We are the first MRF material recovery facility to implement a full-time program for that. I can still remember, boy, it's probably been nine, 10 years ago now. Um, this whole talk kind of started with a little collaboration with ConAgra and Dow. And um, actually a friend of mine from college 
um, reached out and mentioned this idea. And then it kind of got started, uh, Dale and I sitting down and um, went through the details. And one of the first things Dale came back with was um, basically saying, yeah, we are interested in doing this. Uh, we will do it, but we will not do it if it's not going to be a full-time deal. Um, a form of the energy bag had taken place in a community out in California prior to us, but uh, the recycling processor out there ultimately just wanted to do the trial. They didn't want to see it through and make it become a permanent thing, even though a lot of their customers, the residents out there, were um, extremely happy with the program and uh, loved what it was doing. But um, they ultimately said, okay, we're going to do the trial. We're going to end the trial. And that's when we were approached and we said, all right, we're going to do it. We're going to make it a full-time thing. So um, that leads, um, as we get further along here, where we'll touch on uh, the plastics, especially, and then really what we're doing with those and how we're going to ultimately make some lumber and maybe even uh, through pyrolysis and make diesel fuel. So we will touch on that again here a little bit later. So um, what happens to your recycling when it leaves the curb? Um, we will get into that um, right after this slide. I do have a, a short video that actually looks directly at our process, our equipment. It's not a video of some other NERF somewhere across the country. Um, we'll take a look at that and uh, you can kind of see really each thing, including the, um, the uh, optical sorting and how that works. And that's pretty cool with the air, the pressurized air and how it shoots materials based on recognition in the computer. We'll see that um, then we'll look at, you know, where does it go and uh, um, talk a little bit about what the material is made into, uh, biggest problems with recycling. Uh, that's really going to be looking at the contamination that we do get in, unfortunately, and it's just kind of a mindset that people have. Um, we'll look more at the energy bag and what exactly are those hard to recycle plastic items, and then get into a statement that may seem a bit uh, contradicting for what we do, but I'll talk about that in terms of if you're, if you have a question on an item, whether you think it can be thrown in or not, a lot of times it can be best to not put it in recycling. Um, and then i um, really kind of curious what folks are confused about with recycling. Uh, clearly that, I hope that comes with some questions and, um, and then what you can do to ultimately uh, help. With that, oh, one more before the video. Here's something from a 2014 survey by the National Waste and Recycling Association. Nearly one in 10 Americans admitted to throwing their waste in recycling bins when the trash cans were full. Nearly one in five said they will place an item in the recycling container if they are not completely sure it is recyclable. We hear that all the time. Um, I mean, <laughs> it always comes with an apology afterwards, but um, a lot of folks just think, you know, just as this says, I mean, if they're on the fence about it, they think, well, the guys at the recycling facility will take care of it and um, they'll find a home for it. They'll keep it out of the landfill. And um, I feel like I'm still doing the right thing. Unfortunately, that is not always the case. Um, while obviously we try to keep everything we can out of the landfill, it's, um, it's unfortunately just not always gonna happen with contamination or as I mentioned, like with the hefty energy bag, those hard to recycle plastics or film grades, you know, throwing that loose into recycling, most of the time it's um, ultimately gonna end up as a contaminant or a trash item for us, which again, is part of the reason why we have the energy bag, so. All right, let's see if I can get this video to play. I hope.
And unfortunately, doesn't look like I'm going to be able to. So with that, I'll just walk through a little bit of our process. Obviously, it'd be much better if you could see it on video. But um, for those that aren't familiar with how it works at our facility, uh, material comes in and it uh, hits our tip floor. It'll get pushed into the initial pit all this material riding up this conveyor where it'll hit our first little pick station and at that spot we have guys looking for basically glass or plastic film um, other trash items that are a black bag if you will full of material um, those are ultimately going to be trash the glass we do take and that will come out and um, we will get that uh, actually down to ripples where glass goes but after that first pick station, all this material is gonna drop down onto this disc screen. And in these series of discs where it's an incline, uh, basically there's large gaps on this first disc, disc screen. Cardboard having that larger surface area will bounce around and ride up over the top of this disc screen. Everything else falls down through the cracks. So cardboard separated at that point, Everything else goes down to another conveyor where it'll go and hit another disc screen. And it's the same concept. The discs just get a little bit smaller and uh, that is designed to capture newspaper. So as this material gets to bouncing around, newspaper ideally will ride up over the top all the way to the top of the incline and all the other stuff falls down below through the cracks. Now that one, in terms of the mechanical sort, certainly needs a little extra work um, when folks flatten their uh, milk jugs or their pop bottles um, or even you know pop cans if it's stuck in between paper we get a lot that rides up over the top with the newspaper so we have a lot of hand sorting going on with that one um, where they're picking those items out and then that'll be going into a pile where we'll obviously collect that and ultimately it'll end up with its light grades at the very end so again, ultimately, ideally, newspaper is gone, another conveyor, and then a last disc screen, polishing screen, as we call it. Same deal, discs get even smaller, and that is designed to try to capture the remaining little bits of paper. And uh, the plastics, tin, aluminum, fall down through the cracks. Paper rides up over the top, and then all the container grades make their way to our new green machine. And um, that's where it goes through the extensive sorting for all the different grades of plastic that we take that we really prefer in our single stream. And then the tin and aluminum. The very first screen, there's the optical sorting where this computer basically knows what to look for for milk jugs based on shape and I believe color. So once it gets to the end of the belt, and these things start to fall, there's actually air, big shot of air that'll shoot the milk jugs up into a separate container and uh, basically creating our separation right there at that point. After that, we get into the other number two plastic, which is uh, like your detergent bottles and, um, and then ultimately three through sevens. And uh, that'll go through a sorting process with the optical eye and it's the same, same deal where a little bit of air comes shooting out and it's enough to knock these containers into a separate bin. Um, and then there's the PET, which is uh, the largest uh, grade of in terms of plastic that we get, PET being pop bottles. That's sorted in the same fashion. And um, finally, we have a tin magnet that'll, uh, as it's all this material is riding along, tin will get sucked up into this magnet and as the belt is spinning it'll kick it off into a chute and then uh, lastly the last little bit of material will go uh, to our eddy current screen and at the very end of this belt there's a series of magnets underneath that are constantly spinning creating reverse magnetism so that actually pushes the aluminum cans makes them jump off the end of the belt into a separate bin the remaining material falls down 
And uh, that remaining material, uh, for the most part, is material we don't want to be there. So that'll fall off into a pile and then eventually get uh, rerun um, back through the beginning of the process because um, a lot of times it's flattened or maybe a little bit of paper got through. So we will ultimately rerun it at that part, at that point. Move on here. So as it says, three takeaways from the video, I wish I could have shown it, but um, um, kind of based on what I talked about, and I mentioned this a little bit, was um, collapsing of your boxes and not those bottles and cans. Um, I mean, I can remember back when I was a kid in the old can cruncher in our garage and flattening cans. I mean, ultimately that's fine. If you are separating aluminum yourself at home, you know, putting it into a bag or a tub and then taking it to some type of aluminum buyer directly. But when you do that and then throw it in your single stream recycling at home, that makes it very challenging for our equipment to sort that material out. And um, a lot of times it can end up with paper, um, especially the newspaper. Because as I said, uh, on that sort, that really can become challenging uh, when you have those flattened items that might slip through and end up in a newspaper bale. And uh, once it gets to the consuming mill there, they'll be, uh, they'll be taken out, but clearly they don't wanna have to deal with the plastics and aluminum and tin in their newspaper bales. So uh, flatten boxes, but please don't flatten the bottles and cans. Um, this one, there may be a little bit of gray area. Um, we get this asked a lot on how clean should their recyclables be. Um, and here we're, you know, we're really talking about plastic containers. I mean, take a ketchup bottle, for instance, you really don't have to, you know, you use all the ketchup that you can in the container. You don't have to sit there and rinse it out till it is 100% clean. That little bit of residue isn't going to hurt anything. It's the ones where, you know, a quarter full of ketchup still in there or a tin can that has half full beans in it. Um, it's really mainly, you know, get out what you can and um, don't leave a quarter, half. <laughs> Um, God forbid, a full thing of food and throw that into your recycling. Uh, that, as you can imagine, smell, uh, the messiness is, is an ideal. So, and then um, as I touched on a little bit earlier, know what to throw. Uh, don't put items in that don't belong that have to be sorted out and end up in the landfill anyway. Again, so that uh, goes back to kind of that phrase of um, when in doubt, um, throw it out. Or if you are using the hefty energy bag and it falls under one of those categories, please put it in the energy bag and uh, then put that in with your recycling. Again, here's the, the same idea um, as what I was just saying, the recycling myth, just because something has the recycling symbol on it, doesn't mean it's recyclable. Uh, that symbol is to help processors establish what material the product is made from. Um, you start to see this more, um, especially on some plastic film packaging where in really like bold print, they'll put this recycling logo on there, uh, which is great. But then in some cases there's even type um, where it says 100% recyclable, put it in with your recycling. And we've seen multi-layered plastic packaging. What I mean by multi-layered is there's actually different grades of plastic that go on this actual this piece of film. So there could be, you know, a number four on there and a number seven is the one you see a lot. That's multi-grades of plastic. We really have, there's no plastic recycler out there, a buyer 
that would truly want something made out of two different grades of plastic, especially like in a film type of material. So, I mean, unless, and if this is even possible, unless you were willing to do separation of the package, meaning pull apart the two plastics from each other, then at that point, that's an item that really should go in your uh, energy bag. If we're talking film, if we're talking some type of plastic container, I mean, unfortunately, um, if it comes into us with all the single stream, it's probably going to end up going into the landfill. Again, for all those reasons I just stated, um, you know, multi grades of plastic, and uh, it just becomes very challenging at that point. So, moving on. So here are some of those actually uh, right here we can go through. I mean, a, a couple of these are obvious, the ones and twos. Number ones you'll find on the bottom of, um, you know, every pop bottle, um, green, clear, um, dark. I mean, all those PET bottles, absolutely throw in the recycling. Number twos, obviously your milk jugs. Um, uh, detergent bottles are the ones that come to mind. Um, and then you get into some other rigid ones like uh, maybe a, a cat litter container. I mean, that's going to be a number two. Uh, those definitely throw in with your recycling. Uh, number three is a PVC, polyvinyl chloride. And PVC, excuse me, is recyclable. But that's one of those we really kind of have to take a look at. And uh, we've seen PVCs, obviously, you know, in your rigid pipe, people think PVC, that's usually the first thing that comes to mind is that white or gray PVC pipe. Um, that is recyclable, but they're, the buyers really come in, in and out of the market on that. I mean, we've had times before where we'll take that in and all of a sudden nobody's buying it and we have to sit on it for six, eight months. I mean, maybe even a close to a year that it's been. And, that, and that's true of some of these other grades as well, um, the harder to recycle ones. So with PVC, we don't want that in single stream. Um, it, that's something that you know definitely is um, gonna be thrown out. And I mean, if we're talking about a business that produces a lot of PVC, we work with those folks and it really just depends on how we're getting it in, what form it's in, and uh, the big one being how much is being produced because, you know, we can't sit on 500 pounds for an extended period of time. And um, while we're waiting to, you know, be able to fill out a truckload with this material. So PVC, when it comes to household single stream recycling, that's a no. Uh, the number four, LDPE, that stands for low density polyethylene. Uh, those are typically all going to be your film grades, you know, shrink wrap. I mean, what your bread comes in, any of that plastic film packaging, that is an energy bag item. Uh, that's probably the biggest reason why the uh, energy bag program was started was to capture film grades like that. I mean, you think about how much uh, items, you know, in your kitchen, wherever that you get come wrapped in some type of plastic film. Uh, if you try to throw film in loose without being in the energy bag into your single stream recycling, it's in some cases it could end up with paper, which is ultimately a contaminant for the uh, consuming paper mill. Or as it comes through our process, it could get stuck in equipment as it's winding around and um, really just becomes uh, impossible to uh, gather in the single stream if it's not in the energy bag. Uh, number five, polypropylene. Um, these you'll typically find um, a lot of refrigerator type stuff like a yogurt container, um, other items like that. Again, yogurt, ketchup, as I was saying before, try to get out as much as you can. Um, I mean, if you're willing to actually do the steps of fully rinsing and everything, that's great. We certainly appreciate that. Um, but we know a lot of people just aren't going to take those steps. 
So we ask, you know, get out what you can and, uh, and then put it in your recycling. Uh, and then number six, uh, polystyrene, typically your styrofoam, um, an item that's perfect for the energy bag. And, um, and then number seven, that's kind of what I was touching on before, where you really get into all these different grades of plastics. And in a lot of cases, there'll be uh, two, three, I mean, four different types of plastics that can make up whatever product that is on. And uh, so that is definitely an energy bag item. And so again, then um, really harping on <laughs> this one, uh, the wishful recycler, um, you know, again, we, we love these people because they're recycling, they want to do the right thing. But um, in this case, when you're just not sure, and you think I'm going to throw it in there and the recycling center is going to take care of it. They're going to keep it out of the landfill. It's going to go somewhere and get recycled. Um, that is not the case. It means more contamination for us and um, can mean recyclables or in this case, I mean, these items going to the landfill. And so I think this next one will, there you go. If in doubt, throw it out. Again, as I said, and I was speaking with Danielle back at our office, I mean, this can be construed in the, in the wrong way. I mean, if you're knowledgeable about recycling and you've been doing it, you know what should go in there. And then all of a sudden you see something and you, know, you can't find a recycling symbol on it, or you think, geez, it may have something else here. If in doubt, throw it out. I mean, we, we'd rather not send material to the landfill. And um, cases like this, when this happens, I mean, sometimes, yeah, I mean, we, we do. We do have some trash that has to go to the landfill. So um, in terms of truly what goes in your recycling, I mean, any, all of your paper grades, um, or excuse me, read the, what does recycling get turned into? So with paper, we have a lot of our newspaper, the majority of it, in fact, will go into uh, insulation. Um, it will go to an, an insulation company and be made into that insulation. And then egg cartons is the other big one in terms of where our material that we process um, at our Omaha facility, where that goes. And then to a little bit lesser degree into boxes like cereal box, those type of craft boxes. Um, cardboard is typically, yeah, nothing but new cardboard. And then um, liner, liner board for that cardboard. Um, PET, pop bottles, uh, we sell primarily to one buyer on that. And uh, that will go right back in to make... Uh, new PET pop and water bottles. Um, the number two grades, um, laundry detergent, uh, the milk jugs, a lot of where that goes will go back into um, some type of like plastic lumber, lawn furniture, um, picnic table, or even ag pens as you see here. Um, that's where a lot of that goes. And then when you get into the other grades of plastics, um, yeah, you'll look at really different types of uh, building materials, plastic bags, um, heavy duty ground covers, and um, I mean, even insulation uh, with some of the plastic. Uh, the tin, uh, that metal tin, uh, that is primarily going to go back into be melted down and go into rebar, where um, uh, which obviously with all the construction, I mean, you see a lot of it around um, our area, all over the place. Um, there's uh, a lot of rebar needs and um, therefore being able to use a recyclable item like tin cans is uh, clearly ideal. And aluminum is primarily back into new aluminum cans. So here specifically the uh, energy bag program. 
And um, again, I know a lot of you are familiar with it, but um, the idea behind the program was designed to capture those hard to recycle or non-recyclable plastic items. And by putting it into this bag and uh, obviously making it orange, which is easily identifiable for our folks, putting it into that bag and then placing it with your recycling, we can easily grab that out and, um, and then store up enough to where we can make a bale of it. And then once we have enough bales, um, close to 40,000 pounds, we will um, and then send that material out. And um, we're gonna get into that here in a second. Um, in terms of what we're looking at doing here in Omaha. But um, yeah, the specifics on the, what can go in there. Um, I mean, in plastic films, we're really talking, I mean, darn near any plastic film, really any plastic film. I mean, even like a Capri Sun pouch, uh, like you see there in the graphic, the six ring um, can um, holder, uh, even. I know one that's on the little flyer that we hand out, uh, your toothpaste tube. Uh, once you're done with your toothpaste, you got all that out of there, you squeeze as much out as you can, put that container into your energy bag. Um, let's see. In terms of where the program is, um, it is available in Omaha and Lincoln in terms of being in stores in Omaha. And um, we have uh, Menards, Hy-Vee's, uh, Target does sell a 13 gallon size bag. Um, there's other, some other grocery stores there. Um, I forget all the names of them. One thing that we have heard a lot of lately is folks actually wanting to participate in the program or they are participating and are trying to find bags in stores. And unfortunately, um, a lot have been out here of late. So we're working on that. And uh, ultimately we don't control the supply chain uh, for the bags. And so clearly we have the contacts though, and we're doing that reaching out and trying to you know, say, hey, folks wanna do the program, let's get the bags back in the stores. Uh, they are available online as well at heftyenergybag.com. And that would be the uh, eight gallon size. So the energy bag, and as I've been saying, and again, uh, for any of you that are familiar or aware of kind of what we're doing and what we're um, looking at doing with energy bag material and other, as we call it, waste to energy right now, um, is uh, actually going to start making some plastic lumber. We have equipment on order, and we hope to be up and running with this by the end of this year. Um, that'll be right on site at our same facility um, off 103rd and I Street. So that will be fed with the uh, energy bag material and then other uh, basically non-recyclable uh, or hard to recycle plastics. So phase one, pre-processing plant, uh, we will turn these plastics into little cubes. And, um, and then those cubes are able to be used in products such as plastic lumber with uh, decking. I mean, even um, one thing we're looking at like railroad ties made out of these same items. Back. Um, so that says by, yeah, the end of summer, um, unfortunately with COVID and some things being on uh, back order, uh, we're probably looking a little closer to November, December, once we get things going. And, um, and then after that, in phase two, looking at developing alternative technologies like chemical recycling um, to convert to uh, the NAFTA, which can be used to make um, other new plastics. So what can you do to help? Recycle often, recycle right. If in doubt, throw it out. Educate your partners and peers. Understand that recycling works best if demand is high. Don't forget to buy recycled products. And, uh, you know, encourage participation with your daily circle of peers, which um, clearly um, I know the uh, Green Bellevue group um, 
does as much as they possibly can. So some questions here to uh, think about. Um, I think there's a few slides left after this, but um, uh, what are the questions you might have? And then along with these, in terms of uh, what your thoughts would be on these, what do you find confusing about recycling? Um, if anything, what do you wish you knew? Where do you get your information about recycling? What do you wish everyone else knew about recycling? And hopefully you all uh, learned something new today. And lastly, um, there's a quote I think Dale found, uh, definition of uh, waste, resources waiting for alternative, sensible thinking to emerge. So um, really, any type of waste stream, the technology is improving. Um, clearly, like what we're, we're going to be hoping to do here with plastic lumber, maybe um, other options there with the chemical side. You know, um, as technology improves, new ideas come about, and uh, hopefully, we can continue to divert more and more material from the landfill and uh, actually find some alternative here and uh, make a product or do something else with it besides simply filling up our landfills. I think that was it. Yes. All right, Kyle, we have a couple of questions in the chat. Okay. So, um, and then we have a story uh from one of our participants as well that we can get to um somebody asked if they may share the slides as long as they give first our fiber credit um i don't think that would be a problem um i better double check on that um i can get back to you and let you know well tomorrow i'll I'll double check and um and then let you know if that's okay okay and then what about a paper coffee container with a metal bottom should that be pulled apart that would have to be pulled apart correct if that and came then, into us i mean it's the chances are it's probably going to go out with some type of mixed paper grade um but what'll happen is it'll go off to the consuming mill and it'll go into their process. And one, if they see it, we will be notified on it and could be um, essentially, you know, downgraded or dinged or given a warning. Um, but yeah, it would have to be removed. And what about tea packages and other things that are paper on the outside and silver uh, metallic on the inside? Yeah, that's, Unfortunately, it was one of those items with the different layers on there that would have to be a trash item. I mean, un unless that paper could somehow be removed from that uh, silver metal deal. Okay. Oh, and what happens to the actual bag that uh, the energy bag stuff is in? Oh, that just uh, ultimately goes right into the same process. Um, so like when we make this plastic lumber, the entire bale, we're going to cut the metal wiring off, recycle that, and then the bale will go through basically this grinding portion, but it's nothing but orange bags that will uh, go in and make those cubes at first, and then the cubes are going to be what makes the plastic lumber. Okay. Um, the next question is actually for me. What is the link to the presentation? So we will put the link on YouTube once we have all of the information back from Zoom. So we usually get that up within a week or so. Um, uh, you can find the YouTube link on our YouTube page, Green Bellevue, once we get it up. And then people have asked Kyle if the video that was supposed to be on the presentation can be shared. So if you have a link to that, um, or if it's on YouTube, Oh, 
Thank you. Yeah, you know, Katie you just know, posted uh, it. Which, yes, actually, yes, it is on YouTube. So, um, and then in terms of the slides to that other question, I mean, uh, as they, whoever that was, if uh, first star is given credit, yeah, that that's that's totally fine. Okay. Uh, another question: How are the manufacturers keeping naphtha safe? Oh, that's a a good question. And by by safe, um, see, that's from Carrie. Yes. Um, what exactly by safe are do, do you mean? Okay, with the toxicity. Yeah, I mean, again, very good question. Um, I don't have the direct answer to that. Um, Dave Heck, back in our office, has uh, been kind of the one spearheading uh, basically this drive for this uh, new equipment. And then, as we said in phase two, if we look at that, um, it, that would ultimately be on his plate. So I can find that out. And then um, I don't know if uh, if I could get Carrie's email or if um, anybody could share hers with me. I could certainly look into that and get back to you. Another question is, is the silver metal looking film that is often inside a soft plastic packaging metal or plastic? And if it's plastic, can it go into the hefty bag? Yes, it can go into the hefty bag. Yep. Yeah, it's not truly metal. Um, but I, I mean, I do know it is an item that we can take in the hefty energy bag, uh, you know, like certain chip bags and it's kind of that foilish liner. Um, it, it can go in the hefty energy bag. And then it's been requested that you talk about having liquid in containers and what that could do to paper in the recycling process. That really isn't um, that big of an issue. Again, we don't want full pop containers coming in, you know, because um, as they hit the floor and we have our big skid steer pushing material around, um, ultimately it will get broken open. But that being said, when you're talking about on the paper and again, ultimately we don't want it, but when you're talking about like a pop bottle, you're talking about a small amount. So it will get absorbed into the paper. Um, clearly liquid is an issue in paper. I mean, we can't sit paper bales outside and just have it, uh, you know, let them get rained on left and right. Uh, because ultimately where the issues lie is uh, with mold and the longer it sits, and if mold starts to develop, that is a big no-no at, uh, at the paper mills we sell to. Okay. What has been the effect of both Omaha and Bellevue sending their recycling to Nebraska land instead of First Star? Well, in terms of Omaha, um, we still get, uh, I believe the majority of Omaha Unfortunately, with uh, the majority of you folks and Belby residents and with what happened there, um, we are not seeing any of that. Um, I know speaking with Danielle and um, Dale, um, one, we <laughs> would encourage you to speak with whoever your councilman is in the area and um, have them look into the issue more and by that, I mean, simply driving by his facility over there off 42nd and then seeing the piles that he has there. And uh, I really can't get too much into the weeds, but um, yeah, I mean, again, we would encourage you to speak with uh, your representatives and bring up the issue and Again, simply by driving by, 
and seeing and that and that being said request a tour we give out tours all the time i mean when we have groups uh, and i mean it doesn't have to be you know a certain business or other environmental group i mean um we have folks that uh, want to see what a recycling facility looks like what it does and we uh welcome those folks to come through and um others maybe not so much will you sell the plastic lumber directly or to wholesalers good question that is uh being worked out at this moment we haven't finalized anything um but i do know we are starting a list of people that uh are interested once we had the news report that came out you know our kind of our groundbreaking here a few weeks back um, we did get some calls and emails of people that are interested and um uh, i would encourage anybody here i mean if it is something that you want to look at and would like to buy some let us know we can get your name number email down and then reach out once we know exactly what we're going to do with it um, i believe it likely will go to some local wholesalers but again it's uh, nothing finalized just yet okay Ooh, shredded paper should it be loose or in a paper bag shredded paper should be in a paper bag all right yes how are window envelopes dealt with? Um, in terms of single stream, when you put envelopes in there, it will ultimately go out either as a, a mixed paper or as a little bit higher grade of white paper. And where the consuming mills typically don't like that, but when it comes to envelopes, they have some allowance for those. And as it goes through the pulping process at these mills, they are able to basically get that plastic, uh, that little clear liner off of the paper fiber and um, get it out of the process before, before it really starts. So um, envelopes are totally fine. And that little poly window um, isn't a problem. Um, I mean, to get a little more specific on it, I mean, we do deal with the large, with large print operations that produce boxes, skids full of nothing but uh, poly window envelopes. And we do have certain buyers that call it that certain grade. So they know that they're gonna get in nothing but bales of poly window envelopes. And again, the process that they have, they're able to get that liner off of the paper fiber uh, before it um, starts its uh, chain through the pulping process. Nice. All right, so somebody commented, I seem to remember in the beginning of recycling efforts, the glass was recyclable, mostly clear, and plastic wasn't. Now it's the opposite. Can you expand a little on that? Yeah, in terms of um, glass, we do get that question a lot. Um, there are some MRFs like us around the country um, and um, even um, closer in the Midwest that do take glass in their mix. Um, really, it's a, um, it's a safety issue for us uh, with the way our process works and the hand sorting involved. And, and then on top of that, it's extremely hard from, you know, the actual producer, you know, say myself, throwing a glass bottle in with recycling, it goes into the compacting truck and then gets to our facility, hits the floor, uh, really to keep that bottle intact. So those glass shards, and as it gets even more crunched around, um, as you know, glass kind of, you can, it can get really fine. Um, basically that can start sticking to paper and end up in our bales. And it does become a contaminant issue for us. So when um, Dale and them first started our process back in 2004, I mean, it was decided that, hey, we could take, you could take glass to the drop-off sites in Omaha, but we do not want it with the single stream mix. We want to keep it out. And, um, and that's something that we really don't look to be going back on. 
And in terms of plastic and kind of that flip-flopping, essentially with plastics, as I mentioned a little earlier, when it comes to the technology and being able to basically expand what, uh, what plastic uh, these buyers can take, what they could make uh, be made back into, really all that's really expanded. Therefore, that's expanded how much plastic recycling um, is available and what you can throw in with your single stream. Um, back in the first start of recycling, um, at least around here, I mean, the capabilities of not only, as I said, you know, being able to make it into a certain product at the very end, but companies like us that could sort it out because of all those different types of uh, plastics, that's really grown. And uh, we've been able to take more and more grades um, and therefore we uh, let the public and anybody else that participates, you know, hey, throw all these different plastics in there. Um, but it is a good question on the glass. We do get asked that a lot, but um, we uh, don't foresee that changing in terms of being able to throw it in with single stream. Um, it does have to go to a drop site and, um, and then it will go to a facility down in Kansas City where uh, that'll be made into uh, insulation. Okay. Uh, Brenda comments that if you want to be sure your recycling goes to First Star and not Nebraska land, you can subscribe to curbside rewards for a monthly fee, or you can drop it off for free at First Star. Dawn says, did you see that Waste Connection bought land to open a recycling center in Bellevue at Highway 75 and Fairview Road? No, uh, that is a new, <laughs> that's a new one to me. Um, I haven't heard that really brought up um, back in the office either. I will uh, definitely be asking about that. And um, yeah, that, that uh, is news to me, Don. Jan asks, are you still making waterproof wallboard? Um, that's something that we have never made. Uh, waterproof wallboard. No, that's, that's not something that we've ever done. All right, Amanda points out that Glassman is an amazing subscription service to keep your glass recycling local. And Ruth wants to know what regulations there are to be sure that the material collected for recycling is actually recycled. Um, I don't really think in terms of regulations, there really are any out there. I mean, it's, it's just got to be folks reaching out to, again, their local representatives and really trying to stay in their ear and then going to um, <laughs> that specific uh, facility and asking a lot of questions themselves. And I mean, besides your representative, you can also reach out to your hauler. I mean, um, I, clearly it's no secret, you know, that's Waste Connections, Papillion Sanitation for you guys. And uh, it's really just trying to get as many people in their ear, I mean, as we can, because unfortunately, I, there isn't much for regulation. Uh, we certainly wish there was because um, Truth be told, we would be curious to see where things shook out with that um, because uh, we do know there's been some other groups, not us specifically, but that have questioned uh, what's really going on at, uh, at Nebraska land and what, how much is actually getting recycled. Again, that's, that's came from a few other groups, not specifically us. Uh, another question, who offers curbside rewards? The curbside rewards, um, that is through, in terms of the hauling, I believe that that is right now through waste management still. Um, but I know AIDS also offers, uh, no, excuse me, curbside rewards is through Gretna Sanitation. Um, they took that over from waste management and that material will certainly come to us. 
Okay. Uh, what percentage of your recycling input has to be disposed of in trash? Um, right now, it uh, kind of bounces between five and 10% is um, where that shakes out. And as I was chatting with Danielle the other day back in the office, one stat that still really sticks out um, when it comes to those plastic films that I touched on in terms of people just throwing it with their single stream recycling and not in the energy bag, we are still averaging about four tons a day of nothing but, you know, your Walmart sack or a high V bag, typically um, grocery store, retail store, plastic bags that just end up thrown in with the single stream and that we are basically sorting out. Now, I want to be uh, uh, quick to say the question was about trash. And now that we are doing this stuff with uh, the plastic lumber, uh, that material will go into the plastic lumber. But we still do not want to see that loose in the single stream. It has to go into an energy bag because what uh, happens, and I don't know how often we have downtime, but the disc screens that I mentioned, these plastic bags will get wound up around these disc screens and ultimately creates a lot of downtime for us in pulling this plastic off of the disc screens, off of conveyors, um, really in places that it shouldn't be. So we want the bags, but we want them in an energy bag first. Do you know where the collected film bags at Walmart, Hy-Vee, et cetera, end up? Are they at a different processor? They would go to a different, um, a different facility. Um, another great question, um, because we've heard conflicting things. Some stores will uh, send that material via truck back to one of their main distribution centers, you know, somewhere close to the Omaha Lincoln area. Um, and others we've heard, <laughs> uh, it may just be for show and they have it sitting there and then it ultimately ends up in their trash compactor behind the store. Um, so it's unfortunately one of those things where it might be hard to really get to the bottom of, but hopefully we could start working with some of these that do try to collect that and uh, do get it bailed up or get it into some form of a large quantity. And, you know, that'd be a perfect item for our plastic uh, lumber. Do you work with any of those places right now? I am not aware myself directly um, in terms of who would be getting that plastic film. Um, the gentleman back at our office that markets uh, markets all of our material to these mill uh, buyers, he would have a better idea on that. But um, no, good question. And I don't know specifically. If I had to guess, my answer would be yes. Um, we are working with some of them. But um, yeah, I, I, I don't know specifically. I would take mine to a, a place that I knew where the plastic was going to. Yeah, that, um, yeah, again, I, that, that's kind of a tough one in being able to figure that out exactly. All right. Is the problem with aluminum foil mainly just contamination, like old burnt on food and the like? With aluminum foil, uh, it's really a sorting issue for us. Aluminum foil will likely come in and basically, you know, act just like uh, paper would. So there's truly no good way for us to be able to sort it out. In terms of burnt on food, uh, that wouldn't be an issue. Because uh, we do actually take certain um, foils from manufacturing uh, plants that produce large quantities of it, and then we can therefore bale it up. And that is um, that is recyclable. 
uh, but it, it's really a sorting issue for us um, in terms of having it go in with the single stream. And then when it goes across all of our equipment, it, it's tough to sort out. Okay. I believe we had um, some information about plastics in Kenya. Hakim, yes. did you want to mute and go ahead? Uh, my name is uh, Abdi Hakim. Uh, I'm from Kenya. Uh, thank you for the opportunity and thank you for the learning experience. Uh, right now I'm in four-year university, but uh, I think there's a bigger problem from where I've come from. I've come from a place called Garissa. It's in northern Kenya. It is the hottest region uh, in Kenya and uh, the, the infrastructure that the government allocates each region. Uh, my region hasn't yet like uh, received any infrastructure regarding water. So people have opted uh, to use the PET bottles, the cold, the bottled water to quench their thirst. The sun is ever blazing, hot January to December. And uh, I can say 78% of the population from that region, uh, they are illiterate. And the 22% when the, they get land, they move from that place and to go to the to the urban region. So I think the problem there is the PT plastic. So no one has yet figured out uh, if there is a problem there or are there any solutions. So I thought of a solution whereby I could transform or I could recycle these PT plastics uh, to any product or to, to, to the bottles itself, or to uh, cotton wool, whereby I can like, uh, I can make t-shirts with them, uh, to bricks. So I wanted uh, someone, uh, I've been waiting for this, uh, this Zoom meeting since October 6, since uh, September 1st, sorry. I've been waiting for it. Uh, and I think I would love anyone, uh, Kyle, I would love you to mentor me so that I can sort this problem out. So I can say, for example, like 2,000 bottles are drunk each day in that region. And the best company or the most profitable companies around there are the water selling companies. So the problem is there, but the solution is not there. So I need, uh, I need people to help me out with this. I've been, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lecturer who taught me entrepreneurship unit back in uh, third year. Uh, I told him this idea when I pinched this idea to him. He told me like I would get funding for you. It's a great idea. You could help, the, you could help your people there or you, you could even change the problem. So I've been sending him and uh, many unanswered emails. I can, I can show it even in my phone, like over. Are there emails. international recycling organizations that might be able to help out with this? Um, it's a good question, and I'm sure there are. I mean, off the top of my head right now, I'm not I, not aware of any. I, I would probably have to do some digging online, but I mean, I yeah, there's there's got to be you know some group some uh, some help out there. Um, because PET is, is certainly very recyclable and, um, I, I would think there'd be a solution somewhere out there, but yeah, I would, I would need to do a little bit more digging. So Jan asked and Don answered about Papillion Sanitation, but what, um, sanitation companies deliver to First Star Fiber? Well, that, that. It's a bit of a gray area. I mean, Papillion does still bring in some stuff to us. I mean, they're hauling not only residential collection, but also commercially. Uh, um, Abe's, uh, I believe, primarily hauls into us. Um, FCC, I mean, where they, you know, clearly have the city contract, the Omaha city contract for the hauling. And uh, in terms of the recycling processor contract, that is actually right now, um, in the works and 
I think bids are due here in another couple of weeks. So clearly that's something that we're working on. Um, so we'll see where that goes. But I mean, back to the haulers, um, Abe's, Gretna Sanitation, um, and then really Papillion to a little, to a smaller degree, clearly no Bellevue and um, uh, waste management. And that's a bit to, I mean, it, it kind of, I mean, it can vary, but um, Gretna and um, Abe's and FCC primarily. Okay. So this may actually be more of a question for Don. Uh, why does Bellevue not contract with First Star Fiber? In the contract that the city just renewed, it extended the 10 year contract, the original contract with Papillion Sanitation for three more years. And Papillion Sanitation asked to allow them to take recycling to Nebraska land on 39th and D Street in South Omaha. Uh, I tried to prevent that from happening, but only Councilman Thomas Burns and I voted against it. I did go out and take a picture of Nebraska land, which is in a residential neighborhood. And that residential uh, neighborhood, it actually shows the recycling being dumped outside. So it's not even in an enclosed area where the wind blows it. And uh, I went out right after that large windstorm we had and there was trash all over the neighborhood they do go out and clean it up but it's a night and day difference between the two facilities direct answer to the question is uh, you'll have to ask the four other council members why they chose to allow it to go to nebraska land the main reason is we would have had to increase the fee by about I think it was, I would pay, was under a dollar a month more, but it would have cost pennies more to send it to First Star and the council went with what was cheap, not what was best. So Ruth wants to know what happens to our orange bags then? The orange bags that are going there, um, we, we do get some from him. He supposedly is pulling those out and we will get some orange bags from him, but, um, whether that's all of the orange bags, we clearly can't say for sure, but we, we do, we do get some from him. And we don't know what for sure they were doing. They were not, the Rascal Land was not really even aware of an orange bag program. So until we raised the issue, I think the bags weren't going to the place we thought they would. But that was before all the Bellevue recycling got shifted. Since the shift from First Star to, to Nebraska Land, they have been put on notice that those orange bags are supposed to go all to First Star. We don't know that. And I think Kyle's point of getting a tour and maybe videoing and finding out for sure what's happening and asking some questions, uh, we're all in the dark. So Ruth also asked if the city had taken a tour to make sure that they can process our recycling. I think that is a great question for each of us to ask our council members who made this decision um, to follow up on that. And that's one of the benefits of Green Bellevue being a grassroots organization is that these questions come up and we can actually do something about it. So each one of us on this call who is a Bellevue resident, reach out to your council representative and ask these questions. Uh, that's the only way we'll get answers. They may not think it's a big deal. They may not realize that there, there could be differences um, until we ask the questions. 
So hopefully we're not all in the same district. I find it pretty amazing if we are. Um, I know I'm not in Dawn's district, so I will definitely be asking that question myself. Um, and Hakeem, Dawn suggested that the United Nations may have some help uh, for you as well. And I would say you don't have, it's best to go directly to your ward council member in Bellevue, but that doesn't mean you can't contact all of the other council members. Uh, there's six of us. And as I said, uh, Councilman Thomas Burns and I both supported it, but the other four did not. So you can contact any of them. And I think it's fair to ask them to take a tour. And First Star has offered it and many of us have gone there, but we've never had that opportunity or option at Nebraska land. If you don't know who your representative is, you can go to the City of Bellevue webpage and you can look it up. You can also get the contact information for all of our city council representatives, um, as well as the city administration, just for future reference, if that is ever something you need. Yes, please do include the mayor because he also, had there been a tie, had there been one more person who one council member who had voted with Thomas and I, it would have been a 3-3 split and the mayor would have broken the tie. And the mayor did say he was going with the lowest price. So he would have allowed the diversion to Nebraska land. So don't leave out the mayor. All right, we have just a couple more minutes if anybody else has any other questions for Kyle. Um, uh, I have a question for, for Kyle. Okay. Um, there's an African proverb that says, uh, it says, uh, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day or teach a man how to fish and you feed him for a lifetime and uh, i know for now i might not get help uh, but i would love to be under the guidance of kyle so that i would know like uh the the making of the how to the recycling and uh, the in and out of recycling products the pet the, the hdpe and how to make like best cycling uh, products from the plastics. So if uh, if uh, he allows, I can share my my email with him. And uh, yeah, yeah, that that would be that would be just fine. Actually, I will um, I'll just go ahead and type in my email for you, Hakeem, and. You can reach out to me through that. And then, um, I mean, if you wanted to come in for a tour and we could discuss in person, that would be just fine as well. There, there is my email. Thank you so much. And also there is a state recycling association and they may be a resource in addition to uh, the United Nations who does have uh, people working on uh, recycling and the contamination of plastic worldwide. I think you don't know, we'll also go and check them out. Kyle, thank you once again, we very much appreciate it. Um, I wanna give some Green Bellevue updates. So, you will start seeing some more volunteer updates as we learn to populate our calendars on both Facebook and our website. We are working with the Bellevue Native Plant Society to do some pollinator gardens and garden cleanups. There are several locations throughout the city that need some help garden-wise uh, to promote the native plants and to do it in a way that is aesthetically pleasing as well. One of the comments I get a lot is why would I plant natives? They look ugly or they're just weeds or other things. 
So when properly cared for, they are less work than a traditional garden and they are more beneficial for our native pollinators, insects, mammals, um, all of the things. So check out Bellevue Native Plant Society. Keep watching our Facebook and our website for both plant and pop-up volunteer opportunities. Um, Green Omaha Coalition also posts tree plantings and other things that they're aware of in the Omaha area. And you can always pick up trash as unglamorous as that is. That's one easy major thing that we can do here in Bellevue to keep us green. Um, as well, next month, we have our annual membership meeting. In addition to our usual year in review, we will also be looking at some exciting new membership opportunities coming up. Uh, we have um, some different levels of membership and we have some more definition to what membership in Green Bellevue is. We are also looking at making our volunteer opportunities better. So um, if you are not on our newsletter email blast, please, please, please let us know because we would love to have you on it. We did send out two surveys in the last one. Um, one was for the community forest plan um, of which John Preister and I are both on that committee. It is through the Metro Area Planning Association's Heartland 2050 initiative. And it is a Metro wide community forest plan that has been in development for almost two years now. And we are getting to the point where it's time to look for some public input. So um, if you got our newsletter, please take both of the surveys in there. One is specific to Green Bellevue, the other is the community forest <laughs> plan. Any other feedback you have for us, you can always email. My email is Michelle F, uh, for my last name, at greenbellevue.org. Uh, you can also contact us through our web page. Oh, and Katie has posted some of those links in the comments with our save the date for the October meeting, the community forest plan website, and the Green Bellevue input survey. As well, the board members of Green Bellevue will be meeting in November for an annual planning meeting, and we will be focusing on strategic planning this year. Also, we are looking for nominees to serve on the Green Bellevue board. So those elections are held in October as well. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to get a hold of one of us. Otherwise, thank you for joining us on this beautiful, if slightly cloudy Sunday afternoon. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks everybody. <laughs>